Tonight we are uh, going to wrap up uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 35 and 36. The title of our message is The Lord Knows Where You Live, part two. We looked at the first half of this as we looked at the journeys of the children of Israel. We looked at the Lord giving them the borders of their land, the boundaries. We looked at the lot that they received in life, and we talked about the lot that we received in life with contentment and God knows. Not only the, our journeys where we've been, I was sharing with you last week, just uh, looking at the list that we saw in chapter 34 of all the places about about 41 places or campsites that are given there. And uh, just jotting down in my own life, whether it's a house or apartment, I wrote down all the places I've lived in. And I lived, I've lived in 39 places, uh, houses and apartments and things like that. And uh, every one of them is filled with memories and some of them not so much. Some of them very dramatic. Uh, we lived in a what we thought, my mom thought she got a great deal in Phoenix, uh, in Paradise Valley on these apartments, but what she didn't realize is that it was actually a halfway house for guys coming out of prison. And uh, so we were one of the families that moved into this halfway house, and, and uh, we were robbed when we were there. We, my mom was physically uh, attacked when we were there, and uh, Scotty and I... Scotty about ran into the perpetrator um, in the hallway and my mom had bitten his finger really hard right through his gloves and her lip and it was kind of a, a bloody mess but my mom's a she's a tough old gal she uh, bit his hand so hard he squealed and ran out of the house waking up Scotty and um, he ran out and they'd cut our phone lines before this guy attacked my mom and Scotty and I, uh, I obviously in the hubbub I woke up I was only in the fourth grade and um, uh, so we chased this guy down the alley. <laughs> Scotty had a, a, a knife and I had a, a 20 gauge shotgun. And uh, <laughs> I was in the fourth grade, Scotty was in the fifth grade, sixth grade. And uh, so exciting times, the way we grew up, it's just the way it was. And so every place has a memory. But the thing is, is that in our own lives, sometimes we really uh, get dull to the fact that, you know what, God knows everything about you here tonight. He knows your joys. He knows your sorrows. He knows what's heavy on your heart tonight. You're in church, but there's just something really weighing on you. God knows every detail of that. He knows that it says that the Lord has numbered the hairs upon your head. He hasn't counted the hairs upon your head. That would be a different task. He's numbered the hairs of your head. Every morning, you know, you comb your hair and you look down the sink and there's about 20 you know, and that's number, you know, 378, that's number 789. Or Bob's giggling. It's, it's zero for Bob. But um, the angel given that task in Bob's life has an easy job. It's just the way it is. But the thing is, is that it's really important for us as the Lord now is, is laying out the boundaries. He's laying out the lot in life that uh, the children of Israel have. We, we now look at the boundaries for the cities of the Levites and then six cities of refuge, which are, are really important it tells us in verse 1 of chapter 35, And the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho, saying, Command the children of Israel that they give the Levites cities to dwell in from the inheritance of their possession. And you shall also give the Levites common land around the cities. They shall have the cities to dwell in, and their common land shall be for their cattle, for their herds, and for all their animals." The common land of the cities which you will give the Levites shall extend from the wall of the city outward a thousand cubits all around. And you shall measure outside the city on the east side 2,000 cubits, on the south side 2,000 cubits, on the west side and on the north side as well. The city shall be in the middle. They shall belong to them as common land for the cities." Now among the cities which you will give to the Levites, you shall appoint six cities of refuge to which a manslayer may flee, and to these you shall add 42 cities. So all the cities you will give to the Levites shall be 48. These you shall give with their common land. Now the Levites were the only tribe, as we've mentioned many times through our uh, study through the Pentateuch, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And that is... The Levites did not get a tribal inheritance. The Lord said, I am your inheritance. The Levites served with the priests in the house of the Lord. Now, Aaron's family came from the tribe of Levi. And in order to be a priest, you had to descend from Aaron, who was a Levite. 
But then the relatives, the other Levites that are not of the family of Aaron, were ones that assisted in the work of the house of the Lord. They were assistants. In the uh, New Testament sense, if you will, the priests were like the elders of the church that were responsible for the spiritual well-being of the the congregation. And um, the Levites would be like the deacons that were responsible kind of for the physical aspects of the house of the Lord. And these Levites were spiritual salt and light, if you will, to be scattered. They didn't get one tribe, an allotment like the other 12 tribes, but they were scattered 48 cities from all of the different tribes so that the servants of the house of the Lord would be dispersed or scattered all through Israel so that they would have that uh, effect, that spiritual impact. Now, it didn't really work out that way, but that was the intent. Just like the Lord wants you to be salt and light, that's why he's scattered you all over the community. You live in different neighborhoods. You live in or work in different jobs. You have different um, friends and circles in which you operate. And God's put you there. It's no accident that you're in the job, that you're in the office where you're at. Oh, it is. It's awful. I hate my manager. My, hey, the Lord is refining you. And, uh, uh, you know, your boss might be praying the same thing about you. Oh, it's awful. I don't can't stand this person. I'm reminded of James Dobson, uh, a focus on the family. He said there was a guy that he absolutely hated in high school, and he had this list of reasons why he hated him. And at their 20, uh, 20th uh, class reunion, he walked up to the guy and honestly said, hey, you know, I just want to, you know, in high school, I just hated you. And these were the reasons. And, and the guy smiled and he said, I hated you for the exact same reasons. <laughs> but the thing is, is that it's no accident where we end up in life. God wants to refine us, and God wants us to be a witness to other people. So, the 48 cities. Now, within these 48 cities, there were six cities, three that are going to be on this side of the Jordan River, three that are on this side of the Jordan River, so that no matter where the accident of manslaughter took place, you could flee to that city in about a day's journey. Now, this was important because we're talking about a culture that has no police system. Think about this. As you go through all the law, there is no police force. There are no jails, okay? There's no, imagine that. No police force, no jails. The culture that God set up these civil laws was to operate and to function and to take care of their community. And this was a vitally important issue. Murdering someone is very different than accidentally killing someone. We call it manslaughter. Here we have it, the man slain. And it's now going to give us the distinction between those things and how those issues were to be dealt with in a culture that has no police force, it has no prisons. So it says in verse 8, and the cities which you will give, excuse me, will give shall be from the possession of the children of Israel, from the larger tribe you shall give many, that's the cities, from the smaller you shall give few, each shall give some of its cities to the Levites in the proportion to the inheritance that each receives. So if there was a big tribe, they had more cities, they had to give the Levites more cities of those 48 total that they were going to get. By the way, as you, uh, it said, 2,000 cubits out each side. Basically, if you looked at a community that was about 3,000 foot from the um, total, including the little community. They're little towns, they're little villages, they're not big metropolises, they're not these massive cities. Uh, Even in the era of King David, I mean, Jerusalem was the big city and there was 10,000 people in the city. So to give it, kind of put it in proportion, so uh, something that's 3,000 feet square from wherever the, the city walls were for the Levites to be able to have their animals and pasture lands and those kinds of things. And so if they had a big tribe, like the tribe of Judah, would have many more cities than some of the smaller tribes of these cities of uh, the Levites. In verse 9, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. They shall be cities of refuge for you from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. And of the cities which you give, you shall have six cities of refuge. You shall appoint three cities on this side of the Jordan and three cities you shall appoint in the land of Canaan, which will be cities of refuge. Now, if you don't have a police force and somebody murders another person, how 
was justice served in the nation of Israel? Well, it says the avenger was to take care of them. The avenger is the goel in the Hebrew. He is the kinsman redeemer. He's kind of the, the closest relative that would, in a positive sense, if you were a family member that fell in hard times, he could buy a field that maybe you had lost through bankruptcy. He could uh, redeem um, if, you're, if you died as a brother. He would be the person first in line, like in the story of uh, Ruth and Boaz in, in the, that whole uh, scenario that plays out because her husband died. Boaz was the Goel. He was the near kinsman redeemer. But also if somebody would have been murdered in the family, Boaz would have been the avenger that took care of that. So that family member, and you know, the Lord tells us that vengeance is mine, I will repay. Don't avenge yourself. But in this situation of civil law, that wasn't the case. You were, if someone murdered a close family member and you were the goel, you were the avenger, then you were to go and after the situation, um, they were to run to the city of refuge so that there could be a congregation, congregational, um, the city fathers, if you will, the judges of the land that sat at the city gate, they would judge your case. And they are going to determine whether that was murder, if it, there was premeditated intent or if it was an accident. And we'll look at some of those scenarios. But one of the things that you have to understand is that as we, this unfolds in this passage, is that the Lord instituted back in Genesis chapter 9 verse 6 with Noah when they came out of the ark, the Lord said this, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed for in the image of God, he made man. In Genesis 9, God instituted capital punishment. And capital punishment was for those who murdered a person. You shed blood. Man is created in the image of God. And this was to lift the sanctity of life, a pro-life position, if you will, to the highest level among the children of Israel so that if somebody's life was taken and their blood was shed, that person, if it was intentional, if it was premeditated, those are important ingredients into the uh, judgment that was going to be given, then that man's uh, blood should be shed. He should be killed. Now, there are those today who don't understand what the Bible teaches. There are those who, in a modern day, a New Testament sense, would say there should not be capital punishment today. But even uh, Paul the Apostle, writing to the Romans in Romans chapter 13, verse 4, says that that's exactly the authority that God has given civil authority. It says, for he, speaking of a police officer, a judge, an executioner, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Should there be execution today? If somebody murders another person and they go to prison, what's the Bible say? That God has given authority to the governments of the land to, through a trial, discover justice and then execute the perpetrator or the murderer that has done that. And that is a total biblical perspective. From Genesis all the way through Romans, it is God's heart that life be so valued that this life and what, what has happened, you know, the Bible says, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Now we have a sanctity of life for the, the perpetrator or the criminal. Oh, let's save his life. Let's protect his life. This poor victim, no, nobody's bemoaning their case. They're dead. But this is where God puts the righteous judgment is that this innocent victim, this is where the sanctity of life was. This person cut their life short. Therefore, he has given authority to execute uh, people that have uh, murdered another person. Even when that person, maybe they were a bad individual, they go to prison. I don't know if you remember the case when uh, George W. Bush was the governor of Texas and there was this uh, woman, she had killed her boyfriend. She caught her boyfriend with a girl and she took a pickaxe to the two of them and killed them brutally. It was a, and, but when she went to prison, she got saved. She became a Christian. She, for 14 years, she, through all of her appeals and everything, she served in an incredible way as a Christian witness, now as a saved person, formerly the uh, pickaxe murderer, <laughs> 
now a saved sister in the Lord. I can't, I can't imagine a, a woman coming at you with a pickaxe, but she pulled it off. And the thing is, is that there was a lot of pressure because President or Governor George W. was a Christian. She's a Christian. There was this appeal. But the thing is, he let the sentence go. She was executed. She killed these people. It's great she's born again because now that she knows the Lord, she's going to be executed and she'll be with Jesus. But she pays the price for what she did. If I went out and premeditated uh, and uh, murdered someone, um, can the Lord forgive me? Yes. Should I be executed? Yes, according to the Bible's perspective, okay? And I know that there's a, we live in a day and age where all these things are not politically correct. It's, uh, there's kind of this bleeding heart, liberal, crazy perspective, but man, this is Idaho. We get to preach it like it is. So <clears throat> we like it that way. You know, I'm a, I'm a type of guy, just tell me what the Bible says. And I don't, you know, a lot of, this is what many people do. They come with all of their opinions to the Bible. And anytime the Bible doesn't agree with their opinion, they go, well, I don't agree with that. And that's not my opinion. No, the Christian comes to the Bible and says, yeah, I got all these opinions and I'm going to shove them over here on the shelf. And I'm going to let God's word give me the opinions that I should have. That's what the Bible says about renewing your mind. It's the right thinking. Thinking the way God's word says it is right thinking. Being contrary and contentious and oppositional to the word of God because you think you're, you're kinder than God or you're smarter than God or you're wiser than God or you're brainier than God or you, you got the universe figured out better than God is, is a really foolish position to not only hold but to try to defend. And so here we have it laid out in the Old Testament. It's reaffirmed in the New Testament. It tells us here in verse 15, these six cities shall be for a refuge for the children of Israel, for the stranger and for the sojourner among them that anyone who kills a person accidentally may flee there. The city of refuge had a specific purpose. You and I are, uh, <laughs> you know, we're out here, we're chopping wood. Everyone chopping wood. You got your chainsaws and, and, and you're chopping wood and something happens and I, I swing my axe and I don't know if I've had axe heads that slip off and you're always you know, pounding another wedge in the top of it, but you're, you're just out there with your buddy, you're chopping wood and you swing your axe and the head comes off and you look over there 15 feet away and the axe has hit your buddy in the head and he's dead. It wasn't premeditated, it wasn't intentional, you were friends, it was a total accident. Well, what are you to do? Now, if you're that person's brother, you might not care that it was an accident because he just killed your brother. And there's a sense of, of you know, a, a human emotion that is being protected here from that vengeance. Now, you need to beat feet when that accidental murder happens, and you need to beat feet for a city of refuge. Whatever the closest city of ref refuge is, it, it's, it's kind of like um, when your kid's playing hide-and-seek or uh, tag, you're on base. you got to get to base. So that the, all the information can come out so that people will discover that it really is an accident. It says in verse 16 that it talks about um, intentional murder. But if he strikes him with an iron implement so that he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he strikes him with a stone in the hand by which one could die and he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he strikes him with a, wood, wooden hand, uh, a wooden hand weapon by which one could die and he does die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The avenger of blood himself, this is the close family member, he's the executioner, shall put the murderer to death. When he meets him, he shall put him to death. If he pushes him out of hatred or while lying in wait, hurls something at him so that he dies or in Enmity, he strikes him with his hand so that he dies. The one who struck him shall surely be put to death. He is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. So very straightforward. If you had the intent, you were deliberate, you used a weapon that, I mean, you know, if you're going to hit somebody with a rock like this, it's likely they're going to die. If you got a baseball bat, it's likely they're going to die. If you got some iron uh, rod in your hand, it's likely they're going to die. That's your intent by the way that you attack them. So even if they did that, they might flee to the city of refuge. But once the trial happens with the city elders, the city fathers at the city gate, they'll figure out, oh, this, this was murder. And they'd had bad blood for, you know, um, a long time. 
years ago when uh, we were, uh, you know, living out on York Road and uh, an issue happened in the city of Ammon where two older guys were neighbors and they were constantly arguing and bickering all the time over their water. Now, if you've ever fought over water, uh, it, it's... It's life and death stuff. You don't mess with somebody's water. You take their ditch water. You know what I mean? So they had bickered for years over this. And, and one guy, it was, it was the one neighbor's day for the water. He had his water set. This guy came and stole his water, put it on his lawn. They're just watering lawns. It's not like they're growing a crop of a 1,000 acres. You know what I mean? It's, but they're watering their lawn. And they went back and forth. And finally, as these two older guys, the guy had had it. He went over with his shotgun, and he shot and killed his neighbor right here in the city of Ammon because he took his water. And then he sat on his back porch and he put the gun under his chin and he killed himself. And, uh, you know, Gordon was still a police officer at that time and got the call to go to that specific call. But I remember the, the thing and, and just thinking to myself, over watering your lawn. But think about the things that have begun to grow in animosity or irritation with a neighbor. They mow their lawn at six on Saturday morning. They got their music up loud. They got, you know, all kinds of things. And the thing is that you want to think about when we go through this process of looking at murder. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter five, he said, you have heard it said that you shall not murder. But I tell you that if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're in danger. If you say raka, which means you empty-headed fool, okay? And some of you said that in your car driving here. <laughs> Somebody pulled in front of you, you're just like, you know, <laughs> whatever. And, and that what Jesus was saying that, yeah, there's, there's murder out here, but really murder starts in your heart. It starts with a, a bitterness, it starts with a hatred that turns to bitterness, things grow in your heart to where there's an unforgiveness and it, and it builds and it erupts. And Jesus says, you know what? There's murder in your heart. And so you and I are going to see as we look through this, you know, it's a good thing that we have a city of refuge in the Lord Jesus to run to because there are times that our hearts aren't right. Maybe even here tonight before we even get any further in the study, you know, you got to deal with some bitterness in your heart towards a brother or a sister, a coworker, a neighbor, whatever it is, and just give it to the Lord and ask the Lord's forgiveness for that hatred and that animosity and that bitterness that's just seething there, man. It's just cooking underneath the surface. And, and who could tell? Maybe it's been going on for nine months. And, and if it was to erupt on, on, you know, I was ministering to a woman one time in our fellowship years ago, and uh, her husband had uh, left her for another woman. And it was a very painful thing, obviously, and the betrayal and all that stuff. And uh, shortly after that, as she, this man and this woman were together outside of a restaurant, she came out and she, as she got in her vehicle, there they were, right in front of her car. And the temptation was overwhelming, she said, to hit the gas and kill them both on the spot, to take them out. And you know, praise God that self-control and the fruit of the Spirit, had, you know, helped her not take these two out that had hurt her desperately. But here, as we look at this, when we have tough decisions to work it out for maybe, is, it's a question mark whether it was an accident or if it was premeditated murder. It says in verse 22, However, if he pushes him suddenly without enmity, they haven't had any bad blood, or throws anything at him without lying in wait, meaning it was an accident, or uses a stone by which a man could die, throwing it at him without seeing him. He didn't see him. He's just, you know, he's, maybe he's picking rock and he's throwing rock and he didn't see the guy. So that he dies while he was not his enemy or seeking his harm. He's never been his enemy. He has no intense or uh, intention of uh, malicious actions towards him. Verse 24, then the congregation shall be tw judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood according to these judgments. So the congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of avenger of blood, and the congregation shall return him to the city of refuge where he had fled. And he shall remain there until the death of the high priest who is anointed with the holy oil. So now an accident happens. You know, it happens in, in car wrecks. Uh, you know, 
It wasn't intentional. Now there's beginning to be a lot more uh, um, forcefulness with the law if you're under the influence of drugs or alcohol because then there's a reckless endangerment type of thing. But, you know, some accident happens. Maybe it's a hunting accident and, and, and you didn't have any intention of hurting somebody or harming somebody or none of those things. And it just, it just happened. You know, there's, there's um, maybe somebody here tonight and you really feel like you're the responsible party and, and somebody that died. And the, the weight of that and the guilt of that and just the thought of, of taking a, a, a human life accidentally. It's great in this sense that there was a process in which you could go through and be exonerated as they found out the story and you went through the judgment and, and once uh, it was judged it was an accident, then you were delivered from the avenger of blood. You got to come back to the city of refuge. First, it appears from the passage that they ran to the city of refuge, then the avenger of blood, they came and investigated, and if he was exonerated, they went back to the city of refuge. It seems to be this thought that when we see this whole picture, there was, in a sense, because of the death, a limitation now in that person's freedom. Because even if um, it was an accident and the avenger of blood's not going to kill them. They now have to, they had to leave their home. They had to leave their, their community, wherever they were. And maybe their farm, their family, all that stuff. The family could come with them, I guess, but they would now have to live in the city of refuge. Imagine you're one of these six cities and there's going to be a number of people in each of those cities that were people that had committed manslaughter accidentally through some, you know, accident or something. Now, they had to stay there till the death of the high priest. Now, there was blood that needed to be shed in this case or a death that needed to take place. And, and the high priest, now if he just got into office and he's a relatively young man, you might live in that city of refuge for the next 45 years. Think about it. For the next 45 years, you're in the city of refuge because this is a really healthy high priest that's going to live for a very long time. But when he died the high priest died, then you were free from that whole situation. You were free from the guilt of it. You were free from the avenger of blood. You were free now to go back home and enjoy that. I think it's that thought that the writer of Hebrews has in mind when he speaks of the Lord Jesus. And we jump in the middle of the author's thought just to share with you this thought. Verse 18 of chapter 6, it says, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, and this is the thought I want to share with you, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. And he goes on to say that the Lord Jesus is that anchor of hope for his soul. But check this out. Jesus is our great high priest. And he lived a sinless life. Then he died a brutal death. And when he died and rose from the dead, he made a way for you and I as we have ran to the city of refuge, who is the Lord Jesus. And that's what he says here. Having fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that's set before us. Who is that hope? Who is the anchor of our soul? It's the Lord Jesus. You see, you might not have murdered someone intentionally or accidentally, but I know as sure as you're breathing and your heart's pumping, you've hated people and talked badly about them. You've not only hated them and talked badly about them, you might have wished that death come to them. And you say, no, I prayed for him. Yeah, I know how you prayed, that a bolt of lightning would take him out. The Lord says to, to bless our enemies and to pray that uh, God would help us by changing our heart through the prayer of blessing other people, that he would change the bitterness in our heart and the anger in our heart and the hatred in our heart. But not only have we hated people and spoken maliciously about people and at times even lied about people behind their backs or tried to do them harm. But there's all kinds of other sins that you had to run to the city of refuge, if you will, in the Lord Jesus to experience his forgiveness so that you might be set free. And that's what this whole relationship about the Lord Jesus is. Hey, I'm a sinner. I've messed up in all kinds of ways. I run to the refuge that I have. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous will run to it and be safe. I have to have a place to run to experience my forgiveness. I have to have a place to go and to have blood deal with my sin. 
the blood of Jesus. And so we see here in a, a beautiful picture that Jesus is like that city of refuge for you and I. Because most of us, honestly, you don't think much about manslaughter. You don't think much about murder. I, don't, I hope you don't. Uh, that might be your <laughs> issue. You might plot it out in your own mind and uh, have your own imagination going on overdrive. But the reality is that I need, I need that regular cleansing by the blood of Jesus every day of my life. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll forgive us, and he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's such a beautiful thing to experience a city of refuge in that picture of who Jesus is. Well, if you leave the city of refuge, this is an important thought. You in trouble. For it says in verse 26, but if the manslayer at any time goes outside the limits of the city of refuge where he fled. And the avenger of blood finds him outside the limits of his city of refuge. And the avenger of blood kills the manslayer. He shall not be guilty of blood because he should have remained in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. So if you choose by Foolish neglect, and we see this in the life of Solomon. Solomon basically uh, put a guy under the house arrest, if you will. He said, you know, as long as you stay in Jerusalem, you're not going to die. But the day that you leave Jerusalem, and it's told me that you leave Jerusalem, you're dead man. And this is a guy that had insulted his father. He had thrown rocks at David. He kicked dust up in the air. He called David all kinds of names. And when David was on his deathbed, he told uh, Solomon, he said, no, I want to take you to take care of this guy. So this is the way he did it. He said, this is all on you, buddy. As long as you live in this city, you got refuge. As long as you live in the city of peace, Jerusalem means peace, you're, you're safe. But he had a couple of slaves that ran away. And so he left town to go get his slaves and then came back. And Solomon called him and said, hey, man, didn't I tell you the day you left town, you're a dead man? Did you think I wasn't serious? And so Solomon executed him. And the thing is, is that it's important for us to stay in the place of refuge, to stay in the place of grace, to stay in the place of, of relationship. The Bible, Jesus puts it this way, abide in me and I will abide in you. <laughs> Jordan, is that you, man? Okay. <laughs> There's a city of refuge for you. <laughs> Run for your life. <laughs> Cell phone city of refuge. Anyway, the thing is, is that, that to, to stay in that place, to abide in Christ Jesus, in the place of joy and forgiveness and, and enjoying uh, how we are in our relationship with him. Now, he wants to be thorough in this. In verse 29, it's really important that there are witnesses to take care of this. It says, and these things shall be a statute of judgment to you throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Whoever kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the testimony of witnesses. But one witness is not sufficient testimony against a person for the death penalty. You had to have two or three witnesses to put somebody to death. Okay, so uh, if you didn't have two or three witnesses, now our, our justice system is also based on jurisprudence that the basis of witnesses, eyewitnesses, but now we have circumstantial evidence like DNA and various things like that. They didn't have that in that day. This week uh, on headline news um, on yahoo.com was a story that there's now this growing registry uh, throughout the United States of all the people that have been falsely accused. There's now 900 people on the registry that have been falsely accused, in prison 19 years, 15 years, 10 years, 900 people in the United States of America falsely accused. They said almost all of it is through false witnesses or perjury. People flat out lying about them or mistaking identity and yet sticking to their guns. They, they say it's the person and, and it's an innocent mistake, but perjury. Now, this is the thing that the law laid out. If you were a false witness and you, were, you testified that somebody murdered or did something that was a capital offense that was punishable and it was discovered you were lying, you paid the price that you were trying to charge them with. So that kind of deterred uh, some perjury. You know, I want you to be stoned. Well, I'm not sure I want to lie about it because if I'm discovered, then I'm going to be stoned to death for it. And uh, that's one of the real problems in our 
um, in our culture with gossip and rumors and, and the information age, that if something's just said, it's, it's like Mark Twain said, a lie has traveled around the world while truth is tying its shoes, that it's important that there's the mouth of two or three witnesses. It's always good to take things that are said about people that you know when people say things about them and you know it's out of their character, to take that with a grain of salt and not believe that right away. And then just go to your friend directly. Go, go directly to the horse's mouth. Say, hey, somebody just told me this. And just kind of, you know, give, just wipe out all of that stuff. Well, there, those who are wealthy might think that they can write a paycheck or a check, if you will, and get out of it. It says more in verse 31, Moreover, you shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death, and you shall take no ransom for him who has fled to a, his city of refuge, that he may return to dwell in the land before the death of the high priest. So some, some people with money think they can fix everything with a paycheck. They really do. Just if it's, bribe the judge, write the paycheck, and the Lord says no. No amount of money, poor or rich. This law goes for everybody. You're not an exception because you have a lot of money in the bank. So that doesn't work. This is the purpose behind all of this. Verse 33. So you shall not pollute the land where you are, for the blood defiles the land, and no atonement can be made for the land. For the land that is shed on it, uh, the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Therefore, do not defile the land which you inhabit, in the midst of which I dwell. For I, the Lord, dwell among the children of Israel. The Lord lo knows where you and I live because he <laughs> lives with us, if you will. And he says, the land is defiled because of the blood that you shed. And the only way to cleanse the land is shedding the blood of the person that did it, if it's murder or the city of refuge if it wasn't. Now, in verse 30, uh, chapter 36, a story comes up that the daughters of Zelophehad had uh, come up with a situation where all of their, they had no brothers and their father died, and so they wanted the girls to be in a, able to inherit their possession in the tribes of Israel. And so they bring up the question in verses 1 through 4, about that, that it'll be a problem if they marry outside the tribes of Manasseh or any tribe that does this. If they marry outside the tribe, then in the year of Jubilee, when they bought land or possession or whatever, then it'll go back to the, another tribe. In other words, if the tribes were, here's Judah and here's Benjamin, if the daughters could have an inheritance among their brothers, but only if they married within their tribe so that they... Uh, it didn't get all mixed up. And so Moses says what they're saying is true. And in verse 5, it says, Then Moses commanded the children of Israel, according to the word of the Lord, saying, What the tribe of the sons of Joseph speaks is right. This is what the Lord commands com concerning the daughters of Zelophehad. You who are expecting a girl or a boy, that would be a great name for you to put on the list. Zelophehad, saying, Let them marry whom they think best, but they may marry only within the family of their father's tribe. So the inheritance of the children of Israel shall not change hands from tribe to tribe. For every one of the children of Israel shall keep the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter who possesses an inheritance in any tribe of the children of Israel shall be the wife of one of the family of her father's tribe. So that the children of Israel each may possess the inheritance of his fathers. Thus no inheritance shall, shall change hands from one tribe to another, but every tribe of the children of Israel shall keep its own inheritance. I like this, these five girls. In verse 10, it says, just as the Lord commanded Moses, so did the daughters of Zelophehad. These are their names. Verse 11, Mala, Terza, Hagla. Gotta love that. You know she was called Hog for short, just the way it works. Milka, Noah, the daughters of Zelophehad, were married to the sons of the, their father's brothers. They were married into the families of the children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and their inheritance remained in the tribe of their father's family. These are the commandments and the judgments which, which the Lord commanded the children of Israel by the hand of Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. Now, how do you and I learn a lesson from these daughters about their inheritance? They could marry within their tribe. Now, just so that you know, their tribe was thousands of people. It's not like they got this small little pool. They, thousands of people. 
But a very practical illustration that we find in this for you and me is that when we marry, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, we're to, quote, marry of our own spiritual tribe. Not cultural tribe, not racial tribe. It doesn't, you know, the Bible makes no distinction about interracial marriage. That's cool with the Lord. There's a cult, intercultural marriage. That's cool with the Lord. But what the Lord is really strong about is that you as a Christian marry another Christian. The Bible says this in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 6.14. It says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, which is another name for the devil? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Why is this important? Why is it important for us to raise our kids in the ways of the Lord that from the time my kids were little, knowing this principle from God's word, from the time they were little, growing up in an LDS community, I would share with my son and daughter, you know, it's really going to be tempting for you guys when you get older and you're going to have friends and relationships and, and you're going to have some friends that are Mormon and maybe it's this hot looking little, you know, Mormon girl or it's this, you know, very attractive young man or whoever it is, or they're just an unbeliever. They're not LDS or of another religion. They're just an unbeliever. The Lord wants you I would share with my son and my daughter. He wants you to marry a born again young man. He wants you to marry a born again young woman. And from the time they were little, we would have this conversation over and over and over. And parents oftentimes don't share. First of all, many people don't even know what the Bible says. <laughs> but once they discover it, we usually start saying, well, he's such a nice young man. He's such, she's such a cute young girl. And that's true. It has nothing to do with their value. It has nothing to do with... Um, that we're better or anything else. It's just that spiritually you're going two different directions. One wants to honor Jesus, follow the Lord, love him, love his word, come to church, raise your kids in the ways of the Lord. It's really, it's awesome. But some do not want to honor the Lord. They don't want to uh, read the word. They don't want to come to church. And then you say, well, it's no big deal. We're just so in love and he lets me go to church. I want you to know it is going to become a big deal when you have kids. And you bring the kids and you want to do a baby dedication, but they have these other religious roots. No, we want to go dedicate the baby over there or bless the baby over there. And now you have this tug of war. It's weird. When the kids show up, the claws come out. And then the grandmas and grandpas on the other side of the family that maybe are not walking with the Lord as well, they begin to pull and push and you have all of this stuff. And man, it is a bummer. I So I share with, you know, as soon as a young girl or a young man says, oh, pastor, I'm fallen in love and, and, and I want to come to the premarital counseling and, and I'm going to, I want to get married in June. As a preacher, my first job is to ask them, is she saved? Is he saved? Well, and I know when the hymn hon starts that they don't know. They go, well, you know, I don't know. He carries money and it says in God we trust. Does that work? They said, well, he comes to church with me every now and then. I said, well, just because he comes to church every now and then. Well, I'm, I'm the person in his life that I'm bringing him. And, and people look at it like it's missionary dating. Like, you know, I'm going to bring him and he's going to get saved. Well, that, missionary dating doesn't work very well. I just want you to know it really doesn't work very well. And I think that the longer you're married and the more counseling, obviously, over all these years, because I've been a pastor for 23 years. But this last weekend, Tammy and I celebrated our 26-year wedding anniversary. And... Uh, Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's by the grace of God. We joke all the time. Divorce has never been an option, but murder's been on the table many times. <laughs> but, you know, by God's grace, 26 years of marriage. So the thing is, though, is that I love Jesus. She loves Jesus. God's word is the authority in her life. God's word is the authority in my life. I want to worship the Lord. I want to serve the Lord. I want to raise my kids in the ways of the Lord. She wants to serve the Lord. She wants to love the Lord. She wants to raise our kids in the ways of the Lord. And so we're, we're going the same direction. As you're going the same direction, you're drawn closer together. 
And your kids, they are, they're the beneficiary of a godly home. But you know, I know that some of you, as we are here tonight, some of you are married to unsaved people. Now, this is the thing the Bible teaches. Before marriage, I strongly dissuade people from, I mean, if they're not saved and you don't know that they're saved, and, and it, don't do this. Call it off. Well, the invitations are, hey, a, a divorce down the road is much more painful than you just canceling the invitations. Just, just end it. But then some of you here tonight are married to an unsaved person. They don't know the Lord. You're married to them. You're committed. Now, the Bible says, now, if you're married and they're willing to live with you, make the most of it. So this is the thing. So if you're married to an unsaved person, don't seek and run out to get a divorce. The Lord says, no, if they're willing to put up with your Christianity and you go into church and you read in the Bible and you love in Jesus, then hang in there and make the best of it. But prior to marriage, don't do it. Don't do it. This is what people, because we all like sheep have gone astray, each going his own way, and, and we can be rebellious sheep. I share with people, don't get married, they go ahead and do it. Now they're married, and, I, and they come and complain. Well, you know, Pastor, you're right, we've been married six months, and it, it, he really is, he, did, he, he, he doesn't want anything to do with God, and this and that, and so now I'm going to leave him. I said, no, no, don't leave him. The, 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 is he willing to live with you? Oh, yeah, he's madly in love with me. I said, then the Bible says hang in there. I see him a month later. I divorced him. <laughs> I told you before you married the guy, don't marry him. He's not saved. Once again, this is not racial, it's not financial, it's not cultural, it's, it's spiritual. It's spiritual. If you're married to an unsaved guy or an unsaved girl, your job is to be, let your light so shine that you win their hearts. That's, that's God's heart for you. That you love them, that you draw them, that you, your life is so transformed right in front of their eyes that, uh, you know, we've had people over the years, God's done such a work in people's lives that they come to church and said, my wife or my husband is such a radically different person, I just had to come down here and see what was going on. <laughs> and God has an effect. You know, he reaches people. Even, you know, Pastor Gordon and Roxanne, Gordon was not saved, uh, according to his own testimony, for the first 12 years of their marriage. So Roxanne jokes now, for the first 12 years of their marriage, she couldn't get him into church, and now she can't get him out of the church. <laughs> but it was, you know, it's that, that witness, and so God can save the unsaved spouse. But, you know, someone's here tonight, and you know what, you're dating somebody that's not saved. I just encourage you, why date somebody that's not, well, I'm not going to marry him, I'm just dating him. Dating leads to it's just find out if they're saved and be bold about it. Do you love Jesus? Can you say Jesus is Lord? If they can't say Jesus is Lord, run for your life. <laughs> because marriage is hard enough with two saved people. Let me tell you. <laughs> with two saved people, they need all the grace of God we can get, right, for married people. So this tribe, what they decided to do is to marry within their tribe. And and it's just a great spiritual application for us. Hey, you know what? We're of Jesus' tribe. We love him. We want to serve him. We want to follow him. And so find somebody, if you want to get married, find somebody that loves him even more than you do, that they might be a tremendous blessing. I can't tell you what an honor it is to be married to my wife and her love for God. It's just amazing what she has done in my own life to minister to me. And that's what you want for relationships. And so may you, you who are in unequally yoked situations, pray for your spouse that they might come to Christ, live a loving Christian life. You who are not involved, uh, married yet, but are maybe messing around with it, get out of it. Get out of it. And uh, uh, just honor the Lord. Honor the Lord in that.